Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I am not Glenn Miller. Um, I apologize. Um, I'm Sean Hurdle. I've spoken uh, way too much today already, uh, but uh, it's really my, my honor to, to, um, to be here uh, in Glenn's place. Not that he's uh, replaceable by any means. Glenn sends his regrets. He had a family emergency. Um, Glenn um, has really the master of the subject. He does a lot of research as the Vice President of Research and Education for the Canadian Urban Institute in Toronto. And he really, his research is really lately at the intersection of, of infrastructure of all kinds. Well, we're going to know that, that there are many different types of infrastructure. That is to say there are infrastructures and the intersection of infrastructure and aging. So it's, it's my honour to, to be here and to introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, first, uh, speaking first, is uh, Professor Pierre Filion, uh, Professor of Urban Planning and School of Planning in the University of Waterloo. And Pierre is a planner. And his um, current research interests are downtown, inner city planning, metropolitan region planning, and land use planning and interaction. And he is the, um, involved as the infrastructure lead on our MCRI. So thank you, Pierre. And uh, coming a, a fair way is uh, Louise Johnson. Uh, Louise is professor, uh, professor of Australian Studies at Deakin University, um, and her uh, base is the suburb of Geelong. Did I pronounce that right? In, in uh, just southwest of Melbourne, in the state of Victoria, in Australia. And Louise um, is a human geographer, and she does a lot of research in the, the gendered nature of, of suburban spaces, suburban homes, shopping centers, and the like and she's here to talk about digital suburbs. So without further ado, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, panelists, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Pierre Filion. I will proceed rapidly. I was told that time is limited, so I'll go through the PowerPoint fairly fast. Hopefully it will be posted, and uh, if you want to look at it in more detail, you can do so later on. The argument I'm going to make is the following one. Is that number one, dispersion or suburban, uh, dispersed suburbanism is the predominant model of urbanization in North America, and it's spreading across the world. I will define it. Number two, that there's a great effort at the moment on the part of planners, less so in terms of the reality of urban development at moving away from dispersion, and the predominant model could be labeled recentralization. Number three is that these efforts are not working so well for a number of reasons. Part of it is because dispersion, dispersion is entrenched, and it's very difficult for a number of path dependencies and mechanisms supporting it to move away from it. And number four, is that the situation is more complicated than it seems. It is not a matter of dispersion bad, recentralization good, and let's try to achieve recentralization, but there are a whole slew of advantages and disadvantages associated with those two forms, and it becomes difficult to determine what form should predominate. Although from an environmental point of view, it is quite obvious that one is superior to the other one, but from a financial point of view and a social equity point of view, it's not so clear anymore. Okay, this first suburbanism to start with. It is a concept that was pieced together very rapidly in the post-war period. And it's characterized by low density, rigid land use specialization within the super grid or super block framework. And there's a picture of what it is here, what it looks like, and you can see the intense specialization of land use largely determined by the boundaries established by arterials. And if there was a competition, if we we're going to ask you, where is this? Is this a place where there's a lot of debate at the moment about subways? It is Scarborough. Also characterized by full adaptation of land uses to generalize reliance on the car. Separation of activities from each other by the space devoted to the car, the arterials, and the flattening of accessibility gradients, which is favorable to transition from centralization to dispersion. 
There's no point of having one major center anymore when you have a car-oriented uh, urban environment because you have flat accessibility gradients and then one location is equivalent to the other one. And just to picture the difference between centralization, so downtown Toronto on the left, and to the right, dispersion, I think that's the 4.1 and 4.27 interchange, I think. Of course, uh, dispersed suburbanism comes with a number of downsides, and this is why planners are so agitated about replacing that urban form and finding a substitute to that urban form. So environmental consequences, greenhouse effects, this is obvious, energy consumption, uh, note on the right-hand side of the uh, slide there, the end of suburbia, uh, part of the end of the suburbia poster for the film. Uh, the argument about peak oil is a bit shaky at the moment because of the fracting that is taking place. Not that fracting is a great way of extracting uh, oil or gas because of the water contamination that comes with it. Uh, quality of life. Uh, congestion is a major issue, health, sanitary lifestyle, infrastructure cost, and standardized development. Now looking at attempts at recentralization, a few years ago, um, Anna Kramer and myself carried out research on metropolitan scale plans across North America, and we looked at the 58 metropolitan regions that have over one million population, and we consulted 331 planning documents which were on the internet. And what it came up with was the all proposed recentralization. So what we talk about when we're talking about recentralization, we're talking about the creation of nodes, high density concentration of activities that are intended to be pedestrian oriented and that are intended to be transit oriented as well and that are meant to transform the way in which metropolitan regions grow by moving them from the dispersion, the scattering of activities to bringing activities together in areas that, are sur that can be serviced by public transportation. Also, recentralization comes within the broader smart growth and urban sustainable envelope, which proposes green belts, urban containment, more compact cities. So those plans propose this entire package, but they do focus on recentralization. And these are the results, and they just show that to, to the extent to which all metropolitan regions are adopting the recentralization model. Same thing, um, same thing for Canada. Some examples of what they look like, the different terms that are given to them, the fact as well that they operate at different scales starts from major downtown areas to metropolitan region sub-centers to uh, activity centers at the community level. Okay, so all these different levels are present in those documents. And different types of uh, recentralization strategies as well according to the metropolitan region. In some cases like Boston, you have a focus in the existing downtown and the secondary downtowns of suburban or industrial cities within the metropolitan region. In Dallas, it is downtown plus transit-oriented development around light rail. And in Cleveland, it's try to keep development to the existing uh, boundaries of the city of Cleveland because this is transit services are available there. They're not so available as elsewhere within the metropolitan region. So there is interest from a transit perspective and environmental perspective to prevent the decline of the city of Cleveland. Now the problems in achieving recentralization, why do we talk about it so much and why is it happening? It is happening to some extent. One needs only to go to downtown Toronto to see it. But mind you, downtown Toronto is quite unique in North America. But it doesn't happen to the same scale or to, to the same extent as proposed in the documents. So there are two types of obstacles to recentralization. The first ones are those that are related to the persistence of dispersed suburbanism. And the other ones are those that are caused by difficulties to create and expand centers. So there's the persistence of dispersed suburbanism. So 
there are things that work with this first suburbanism. It does provide cheap floor space. Infrastructures may be expensive, but floor space is cheap. So if you want to start a business, there's a lot of places to start new business, things like that. You just need to think about the strip kind of retail environment in the typical suburban area, and you've got everything there. The karate school, to the major, to the Walmart, to the uh, Target, well, one repeats the other, but you know, you've got and the, all the car-oriented retailing, you've got all of that on that strip. Distribution of costs. So you've got a distribution of costs that makes it so that a lot of the costs of foot are shouldered by the public sector, and that encourages the private sector to, to expand and to invest. This is a point that uh, Robert Fishman made yesterday. Land use transportation dynamics. It's very difficult to break those dynamics. Uh, they're very well in place. If you affect transportation, then you've got land use that generates demand that you can't deal with. Um, and vice versa. Vested interests, uh, developers, the developers in the stick business who build houses out of wood, they're not keen in any changes in terms of development models and the habit and values of people residing there. So now we look at what the problems with the centers themselves, what the centers need to achieve in order to be successful. First thing is concentration. You need to create a critical mass. It varies according to the scale of center we're talking of, but you need to achieve that critical mass. Secondly, you need to achieve multifunctionality. Because centers, the success of centers is based on synergy between the different activities that are located there, and that synergy requires pedestrian movement between one activity and the other. So you need to provide that within the centers. And the last point related to what I was saying, pedestrian-based synergy. Centers need to provide a pleasant pedestrian environment, a pleasant walking environment. So we can contrast recentralization and dispersed suburbanism. Um, and this is why I'm fussing so much about recentralization, because if we're thinking about how to transform uh, dispersed urban environment to move away from it, we need to focus on recentralization because it addresses the different characteristics of uh, dispersed suburbanism. Concentration rather than low density, multifunctionality rather than land use specialization, and pedestrian-based synergy rather than full reliance on the car. Uh, problems confronting recentralization, competition from dispersed sites, uh, the appeal of cheaper sites, uh, establish connections between centers and the surrounding markets, avoid centers from being invaded by the car, and the automobile should be accommodated in a fashion that doesn't impede pedestrian movement, enhance synergy. And above all, and this is the main, uh, maybe the main obstacles to, being, to carrying out the successful center strategy, recentralization strategy, is that centers require long-term planning coordinated at all scales of intervention and the presence of quality public transit. Okay, now to end this presentation, um, I'll look at the financial and social impacts of the two models. Okay, so dispersed suburbanism, and recentralization. So dispersed suburbanism, first of all, let's look at the land supply and demand aspect. In principle, um, it should allow the extension of urban areas and consequently lower developable land, price, the land prices and contribute to affordability. This is the free market perspective on urban development, the argument that is put forward by Wendell Cox and the likes. In reality, though, there's a built-in limitation on the extent to which an urban area can develop, and it has to do with the commuting times. Another built-in limitation is the limited funding that is available for highway development, and also having to confront the other types of opposition to highway development. So urban areas cannot expand uh, limitless, in a limitless fashion. There's also, one needs to look, when we're talking about housing costs, land costs, and so on, one needs to also factor in transportation with this. And when you factor in transportation, as you can see in the diagram underneath, 
the rankings of cities change. Also, social restructuring within dispersed suburbanism. Okay, the combined effect of gentrification and income polarization causes low-income people to move to older parts of the dispersed realm, to older suburbs, first string suburbs. They themselves find an environment that is car-oriented and they have problems managing it because of the transportation expenses. Where there is municipal fragmentation, like in the US, that first string of suburbs is no longer because of filtering down and lower property values and tax revenues is no longer able to provide services. And when there is quality public transit that kind of sneaks in those areas, they become channels for gentrification. Okay, now let's look at recentralization. So the recentralization in the way that is presented in the plans, it is focused on a narrow accounting, uh, focusing ex exclusively on infrastructure, construction, and maintenance. Okay, I've got one more slide. When there is middle range accounting, it includes the construction and maintenance of different built forms and public and private service delivery within the built environment. When you've got broad accounting, it embraces the other variables plus the variables mentioned, plus land prices fluctuations due to speculation or scarcity. Okay, so, yeah, I just lied. So the narrow accounting <laughs> formula points to lower public sector development expenses and thus potentially lower taxes. Okay? So from the narrow accounting formula, it does make sense. There are uncertain outcomes of the middle range accounting of the different costs of recentralization because of the need to build, operate, and maintain two transportation systems, automobile and public transit. And uh, also, but leads to higher public sector expenses and assume the adaptation, oh yeah, and there's also the assumption that there's an adaptation of the higher, to the higher density, to higher density built forms, which are often more expensive to construct. Okay, so there needs to be a change in the form of housing. Full accounting um, accounts, full accounting also factors in higher land costs because of growth control and the possible lack of adaptation to denser living environments. Saving in roads and other horizontal infrastructures are counteracting by contracted by funding public transit and higher housing costs, which translate in more expensive mortgages and rents. The introduction of centers and quality public transit in suburbs can be channels for gentrification, so low-income residents are not necessarily able to take full advantage of improved accessibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the organisers for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to be talking about a very different regime, and, and potentially one that's um, either going to throw completely into question what you've just heard, because we're in the midst of a very different communication and a transport revolution, or in fact, not much is going to change. So what I'll be looking at today is the notion of a digital suburb, and thinking about some of the policy implications of greater connectivity, technological connectivity. So in particular, my outline, which is, I'm sure, coming very soon. There it is. Um, talking very briefly about what this revolution is, and I'm sure you've got one in your hand right now and are probably using it. Um, looking at some of the implications of mobile and other forms of digital technologies in terms of their economic and social and political impacts. And um, unlike the introduction, I'm actually going to focus on, on Melbourne rather than Geelong, and in particular at the western sector of Melbourne, um, primarily because it's a, an area of relatively low income and, air, and social diversity. But also it's been one that, despite that, is actually being wired for what we call in Australia the National Broadband Network. And so looking at and trying to think through what are some of the planning implications of this digital revolution that we are all up to our necks in right now. And so it's a very familiar story and I won't labour it because I've got a lot to cover, but the military origins, as we know, of computer technologies and the relative recency by which we've become engaged with these technologies, primarily the internet 
and the speed of the take-up is kind of mind-blowing, but also that it's certainly differentiated. There's a geography of internet accessibility, even though that geography is changing very rapidly. So some of the rates of access there uh, are indicated, but the world is still relatively low, so we've got a long way to go. Australia is well known as being completely fascinated with new technology, so we've embraced it with, with great um, enthusiasm. Um, so we now have a huge take up from a 16% internet access, and this is from homes, okay? This is not mobile, this is home-based access. 16% in 1998, we now have nearly 80% domestic access. Most are connecting from home, then from work, and it's interesting to think through what are the implications of this sort of connectivity for how we even design our homes as well as how we use our homes. And the points in red will be basically the research questions that I'll be picking up later. So we've got the sort of rates of usage, we've got the ways in which people are actually using the internet. We obviously have the home domestic connectivity and work connectivity now enhanced by the mobility connectivity that we all have. And so it's a familiar story. What's perhaps less familiar is the so what question. We know it's transformed the way we, we communicate with each other, but what are some of the geographies and other forms of impact? Certainly people like Manuel Castells wrote some time ago that this was indeed a completely revolutionary development. That the networked or informational society was gonna change everything. And so there's been other people who've picked up this idea of transformation around the intelligent city, the knowledge city, the wired city, and so on. There's a set of fairly clear-cut positive impacts, new and better jobs, new industries, potentially, and the actuality of access to online education, health, better and more accountable governance, um, the potential of, of direct participation as well as extraordinary accountability to government, but also negative impacts, destruction of jobs, less face-to-face -face interconnections of people, sedentary lives, fractured communities, and uh, perhaps a reinforcement rather than the creation of new inequalities. So there's a whole range of impacts. So the economic impacts, the whole thing about a new sector of industrial production, a new way of consuming products, a new array of, of those products. So we're actually looking at a way that production systems have been transformed, the way we work has been transformed, a whole new knowledge and service economy is basically replacing the previous one. The annihilation of space with time, the notion of, of having to build great big freeway and other forms of, of, of transportation to move people in particular, well maybe people don't need to move anymore, maybe there can be a whole lot more done from where we are rather than having to go somewhere else. So there's new possibilities for teleworking. There's also new possibilities for the way in which production systems are actually physically arranged. And I won't go through these, but there's certainly very new and interesting possibilities about the ways in which production occurs and how it connects in terms of other producers and consumers. The social impacts have been documented very extensively in North America very much around this notion of the digital divide. These technologies, especially when they first arrive, are not evenly spread across the population. They tend to be primarily taken up by those with higher incomes and higher education levels. They're certainly taken up by the young. Um, initially, um, men more so than women, but that divide has narrowed. In terms of, of who takes it up, it's interesting that it's actually often suburban environments that take this up. When you think about income and education levels, that makes sense, or it has done in the past. So there's some social impacts very much around the notion of the digital divide. And the North American examples and experience has been very much replicated in the Australian context. So the, the differentiation by income is, is real, it's pronounced, it is narrowing, but it's still very much there. So there is a thing called the digital divide and it's real. So other social impacts though, I think are, are important and, and interesting in themselves because perhaps it's actually in these notions of, of social interaction that the transformations have been most well researched in addition to the um, economic ones. And of all things, I found an example from a place called Netville in Toronto, Canada. And um, this is a study that was done back in the 1990s, 
because this particular community, fictional name there, was one of the first that was actually fully wired at the time that people moved into this, this community. And not all of those new residents took up the opportunity of being fully connected to the net with all the various other things that were um, offered by the developer. And so there was a very interesting example of both those who were connected and who chose to be so and others who decided not to in the mid-1990s. A whole lot of possibilities were presented to these residents in this um, fictional locality of Netville. And what's, what's come out of this research was that there's really different ways of relating socially across space within that community. So the people who were wired up basically expanded the extent of their social connections aerially, spatially. So there was far more over a larger area of social connections, but those social connections in sociological terms were much weaker than those who were not wired, who tended to be much more locality based and who had deeper social connections. So as a result, maybe, or perhaps as a result of just exacerbating, extending existing inclinations, social ties of those people who were connected domestically with the, the net and who were obviously using it, they, their social ties were more numerous, they were generous, geographically more extensive, but they were also weaker. And so that's just a, a graphical representation of that. And finally, we've got the political impacts. I mean, is there a politics of this? Well, there sure was in the case of Netville. And so the, the residents of this particular locality certainly use their email lists of, of each other to lobby developers to get things fixed, um, minor housing issues, heating, cooling, that sort of stuff. But they also came together. They, they, the, the means of political communication were, were mobilised and utilised to actually um, try and extend the various benefits that have been given to this community from three to five years. So it was a political campaign, the significance of which um, is the fact that it existed and it used these technologies um, to try and achieve a certain political end. And so the suburban networks led to a greater political involvement they led certainly to more visibility of people being quite happy to kind of be up there and involved with the political process. The cost of those connections, those political connections and actions were, were very minimal and certainly seemed to be a greater ease of organising and obviously a greater ease of information flows. So it's possible, and that others who have gotten a lot more expansive in, in this environment, thinking about what are the political implications of new social media in particular, but this is just in a more general notion of, of greater connectivity and, and internet usage, that we are potentially seeing a far more participatory array of possibilities. We're seeing much more active engagement of people with each other and with governance, demanding of, of governments that they are more accountable. And we've obviously seen in the, the Arab Spring, for example, far more use of, of social media for both reporting, accountability, organising and basically political action. So there's a whole lot of things that are going on here. So what kind of questions emerge from this research, a lot of which has been done in the city but in other places, in um, North America in particular? In the, the case of Western Melbourne, does all this stuff apply and how does it apply? So has there been a shift towards the knowledge economy? Has there been a growth in um, the use of, of teleworking, for example, in the western suburbs of Melbourne, where it's increasingly connected to the net? Is there a digital divide? Has it led to greater sociability? Has it also led to more political action and changed the nature of political action? Now, I'm not going to have time to go through all of these things in, in detail, but the guts of the story is that the western part of Melbourne was very much a, um, a manufacturing part of the city. That manufacturing has, has declined dramatically along with the west of the, the rest of the city, the rest of Australia's economy. And in fact, there doesn't look like there's actually been a major shift towards a, a service economy um, as a result of, of greater connectivity. There's a whole lot of other things going on to explain the change in, in our manufacturing base and move to a service economy. But it certainly has occurred. It's kind of hard to tease out the role of information technologies. But one of the interesting implications for this region is the inflow of people 
with um, higher qualifications and those who are in managerial and professional jobs. And we know from the research that these are the people who are more inclined to use this kind of technology. And at the moment, these are people who basically are signing up to the net in very significant numbers. And again, the, the more social subtleties of, of the geography of this area I, I haven't got time to go into, but basically there's not a particularly strong correlation between low income and low internet usage across this region. So it doesn't look like there's a digital divide. In fact, it's sort of flattening out. Teleworking is actually not happening. Um, we've got an objective in our country to have it up to about 12%. It's 6% in 2006. But basically in the areas that I'm talking about, the fact that 90% of people are wired up, only 2% are using it for work in the sense of teleworking. So they're still getting in their cars and they're doing this. They're going to work, they're driving to work. But there are other possibilities, and I'll just leave that one for the moment. The question of whether the internet has led to more sociability, has changed social connections, has it actually changed the political process in this area? And it's a huge area, and I'm just going to take one part of it, which is called Caroline Springs, which is just basically a master planned estate in the northwestern part of the, the area, 23,000 people. And it's a place where the developer actively creates community. It goes in there and it puts in physical elements to facilitate interaction. It, it puts community development workers in. And of course, the place is wired. And what they also did was they put in a community development worker who very actively worked as a resident as well as a paid worker to facilitate internet connectivity. And basically, um, out of 6,500 residents, when I was doing this work a couple of years ago, 1,500 were actually members of the, sorry, there's an extra zero there, 1,500 were members of a, an intranet, and they basically were very active on those sites, involved with dis discussing issues um, in setting up groups, walking groups, faith-based groups, writing groups. They also were very involved in, in sort of local political action, very, very localised, dealing with um, problems of, of speeding drivers and broken street lights and you know, antisocial behaviour and so on. So it was very much localised behaviour that was being dealt with, but it was being dealt with through this particular medium. And so finally, just the issue of, of what are the planning implications of all of this? Well, firstly, I think we need to just keep the hype of the network society and the wired world in which we are all living into some sort of perspective, that clearly it is transforming huge elements of who and what we are, how we work, potentially where we work, and what we do. So the economic impacts are, are very real. Whether that translates into teleworking, there are infinite possibilities there, especially for people in high income, service sector roles, wired up. But in fact, what doesn't seem to be happening is that people are still based at their workplace. They're, they're not actually taking the opportunity or being allowed by their employers to actually do a lot more teleworking at this stage. My prediction is that why not? It will probably grow and it could well grow exponentially. Um, house designs, um, have a particular fascination with house designs. They are certainly changing in the Australian context. They're gigantic, they're monsters. But we also have increasing spaces within houses. A few years ago, it was all about bathrooms. They were kind of multiplying around the house. Now what we have is study nooks. We have entertainment areas. We have places where digital technologies are used or beamed in or used to kind of help create social spaces within the home. So the spaces within the home are, are altering. I would also suggest that what is needed and what is already happening quite organically is the growth of third spaces. Go into any cafe and you'll see a, a couple sitting on either side of the table, not gazing lovingly into each other's eyes, but absolutely transfixed on their mobile devices. And they'll be doing whatever they're doing on those mobile devices. So those third spaces where we can actually go and be both sociable as well as engage our technologies. And those sort of third spaces where also commerce and enterprise can occur, why not have those particular spaces proliferate in suburban areas? So the idea also that the political possibilities of these technologies is only just starting to be realised in, in our own worlds. 
And there's certainly greater possibilities in the region that I'm dealing with because of the inflow of, of people of the educational and professional occupations that, that happily engage with these technologies to actually decenter all of those commuting jobs that we've just seen people going towards, which tend to be in the central business district. The knowledge economy, the symbolic economy is very much located in the CBD and in certain very localised areas close to the CBD in, in our Australian cities. But there's no reason now why they can't be decentered, because this technology allows it. And as those particular workers are also decentering, then in, there's no excuse, there's no reason why not. So the idea, the possibility, the planning possibility is very real to decenter those kind of activities and to actually minimise these mobilities, to actually localise far more using these technologies. So the suggestion is that we actually can actually get rid of a lot of these mobilities and actually wire up our, our lives far more in, in localities. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, and, and thanks to, for our presenters for being such great sports about the, the further constrained timelines. You guys are fantastic. So I think we have a really neat springboard. We do have, because of their efficiency uh, and effectiveness, we do have 10 minutes for questions and answers. And I think maybe if I can just instigate, it's really interesting. Pierre started about you know recentralization, and then Louise ends by decentralization. So. Let's have some fun with that. So we have 10 minutes for very quick and, and um, what I'm sure will be very concise answers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it possible to ask two questions to one? It's, a, it's very quick. So the first question is for Pierre Fillon. And you talked a lot about pedestrians. You talked about cars and public transport, but you haven't mentioned anything about cycling. And I wanted to have your thoughts on what would cycling do in the city? Because we've seen a lot of cities being developed for pedestrians, carriages and horses, cars, and then public transport. But any city that's based on cycling, we don't really know what it would look like. So just your thoughts on that. And then the second question for Louise Johnson. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's a political party in Australia right now that wants to run on, a, on um, improving the speed of internet in Australia and um, really making it faster and um, more efficient. So the question would be, would that be something that, w w would you see this as an improvement uh, for society or would you see that more as something that's uh, negative? And you, you talked about how um, communities that didn't have internet before, when we brought internet, there was a lot of changes. But what would happen if, for a community that already had, already has internet, and you just improved it? Would there be any changes at all? I'm so sorry for not having talked about cycling, especially since I'm a cyclist myself. I'll never pardon myself for it. Uh, <laughs> Cycling is ideal to deal with the relationship between subcenters and their catchment areas. Because we're talking about distances of two, three, four kilometers, and cycle is the ideal mode of transportation for that kind of range of movement. So yes, uh, cycling should be a major part of that strategy. I didn't emphasize it as much as I should have because I wanted to put forward the point that within the centers, the mode, the privileged mode of interconnection should be walking. But to get from the catchment area to the center, cycling is great. And on the political question about Australia, I've been out of the country for three weeks now, so something might have happened that I didn't notice. Um, the Labor government, which has just been removed from office, su succeeded in getting into office some years ago on the basis of a national broadband network. Um, the new Conservative government that has just arrived in Australia, which is why I'm here, um, is, 
is, is basically saying, well, we, we can't afford that. Um, we, we're going to do something a bit, bit slower and a bit cheaper. And um, so there may well be pushback against that. I'm just not aware of that because I'm, I'm out of the country, despite my morning Melbourne age reading. Um, but the, issue, the other question you raised, I actually don't know whether there was a specific party, but there was this huge support for the NBN. There, there is absolutely no question that that's what people want and are prepared to pay for. Um, the issue of what happens when you put in even faster um, broadband, when you kind of expand the, 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 from wireless to you know, other forms of, of fibre and, and so on, and what we're arguing about in Australia is fibre versus copper to the node, um, is that basically people use it more for more things and the possibilities expand. And there's, again, a lot of hype about what on earth it could deliver, you know, the, the, the hospital in your lounge room and, and you know, the university in your, your study. There's, there's probably a, a sort of inflated array of claims. But there's no doubt that as people get more and more bandwidth, they certainly watch a lot more movies at home. They, they do a lot more, you know, it's entertainment driven primarily in terms of usage. But there is also a huge scope of things like telehealth. And, and education, online education and so on. So what seems to happen is you increase the speed, lower the cost, the capacity, and people just consume in, in bigger and bigger chunks this stuff and, and demand even more and better and cheaper. Oh, okay. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Johnson, but I'd like to hear uh, Professor Filion if he has any insights vis-a-vis in, -vis, uh, uh, Recentralization. Uh, I'm really intrigued by the idea, the, the notion of this digital divide. And I, uh, to give you a little bit of background, I live in a inner city high rise, and uh, the real problem I have with the internet isn't getting the internet to the uh, to my apartment. The real problem is that most of my devices are Wi-Fi based, and I get a lot of uh, Wi-Fi congestion, so that it actually cancels out my signal. And at peak times, I actually don't have internet, even though connectivity, even though it, <coughs> physically it's there, and the signal is, should be good if I was connected. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, how is that showing up in your research uh, in terms of a, a, a barrier for some of, the, uh, some of the more centrally located or more densely located areas? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question, I have absolutely no idea. Um, my understanding, and I'm no tech head, um, is that once you have fibre, those problems disappear um, because it's just so extraordinarily vast in its capacity. Um, I could be wrong there. Um, mind you, I think there's also just, there are problems of, you know, I know my own house, five o'clock at night and everybody gets home and gets online and the wireless sort of nose dives. But I'm also aware that when you put in even more capacity that those problems are meant to, to evaporate. Um, don't know about the high rise, and, and in terms of, um, I think it again goes back to the socio demographics of who's in those high rises. And at the moment, there still is a sort of an education income kind of close correlation with, with you know, large capacity and to buy and, and to consume um, technologies. And so I guess if it's a really rich high rise, you'd probably be fine. And if it's not a rich high rise, maybe not. But as I haven't done the research to actually you know, confirm that one way or the other. Anytime something goes wrong with my computer, with the internet, I love blaming the internet provider. <laughs> I see them as responsible for everything. I certainly wouldn't blame density. It's the provider. <laughs> yeah. How about uh, two, two quick questions, two more quick ones? Yeah. Um, my question is for Pierre. Um, you seem to, you described uh, two things. One is that the sort of um, more affordability in terms of housing in these dispersed areas, but also higher costs in terms of transportation, which kind of balance that out. But then uh, you also described the the kind of higher cost of housing in centres because of things like transit induced gentrification or. Uh, high-rise construction, which costs more. Do you see this as like an insolvable paradox? Or? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. It, mm -hmm. it, it is a fact that higher density housing, if we discount the cost of land, is more expensive to build than lower density type of housing. And I really don't know how you get away from that. This is why those uh, high-rise towers of public housing that were built in the 60s and early 70s were subsidized. They could have been built otherwise because they were too expensive to build. It's, 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 it's a built form that is more I think more it was expensive. a tax loophole, right? 
Pardon me? It was a tax loophole, not direct subsidization. Well, the public housing were subsidized. Oh, yeah, yeah. The limited dividend uh, buildings, that, that was a tax loophole, yes. So, so you needed to have those mechanisms to allow those bill forms to go up. Now it's the condo formula that is working where people, well, we, we, we all know people we live or we know people who live in those towers and you end up paying a lot of money for relatively little space by comparison to what would be affordable, what would be available in the suburbs. So I, I, I really don't know what the solution would be to that problem except consuming less space. Beca beca becoming more urban, uh, consuming more of the public realm, more of the third places and in, in, in a way, when a city moves, when a city grows, uh, a city moves from one stage to the other, and I think that the residents within that urban area must adapt to the new urban reality that emerges from that. And that may be the new urban reality that emerges from a Toronto that has grown over the last 40 years from two million and a half, three million population to about seven million, seven million and a half now, and that will keep on growing. It's a different city, it offers different things, and it calls for different lifestyles and preferences within that environment. One last question, please. I, okay. Um, you, you talked about, just on the technology side, you talked about, um, you know, a few years ago for homes that it was number of bathrooms, you know, just like toothbrushes are always kind of reinventing themselves to sell the new product. I mean, I imagine it's the same thing with, with homes. So to what degree do you think that the, the sort of technological adaptations or study nooks or those kinds of things are just the next trend and then in a couple of years it'll be something else? I think you're absolutely right, of course. It's just that um, I still think you can read a home as a cultural artefact, um, as like any other thing. And, and therefore, what we're seeing in this particular array of housing that I'm seeing in some of these suburban developments in Australia, and the ones especially that have been connected to the NBN, as part of their whole marketing strategy for those homes is to actually maximise those spaces and to make those spaces quite explicit in the marketing. Now, whether that will be different in, in a year's time or five years' time, it could well be. I have absolutely no idea. Um, I mean, there's still quite a lot of bathrooms. They haven't gone away. But our houses are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We, we now have the largest houses in the world with, with 2.1 people in them. Um, it's insane. So rationality never comes into this, um, and it really is about the value of space, the, the way in which space is, is constructed, and that's very much a cultural artefact. And at the moment, it seems to be about places where technology can be displayed and shared. But I think also, back to the previous point about wireless, I mean, you don't need study nooks anymore because you can just wander around the house and do this stuff. So that might have already gone, but I'm still seeing it on the ground as sort of one of the elements that's, that's marketed into this particular um, environment. So I think you're right. I think it will change. Um, I have no idea what's going to be next. And if you do, you probably should be building houses. Great questions. I'm, I'm very sorry that we were a little bit short. Thank you for all of your patience and cooperation. Um, Louise Johnson and Pierre Filion, thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, and I just want to say, Suburban Constellations, to, you know, to sort of do a double of what Roger's pose was last night, but please consult Suburban Constellations. You'll find um, that um, Pierre and, and Louise have both contributed very richly in these pages. and and. While they were a little bit shortened today, they certainly expand upon their knowledge that they shared with you today in this book. So thank you very much.